My goodness, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the kind, kind introduc introduction. I feel so honored and privileged to be here, and I truly want to thank Food Institute for the opportunity to speak with you and also to the Pennsylvania State AARP office that invited me as well. I am excited, delighted, because I get to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is the power of creative expression and how creativity and keeping your brain and mind active uh, can really change how we age and uh, can pr bring magic, delight, and whole new realms of opening uh, for as we get older. And if nothing else that you can remember is that we have the power to enjoy, to change, to delight as we age. It is not at all what we commonly think of aging. Um, and the question is, um, why does all of this matter? You know, how, why do we have to worry about creativity, keeping our brains challenged, our bodies challenged? It's because we are living longer than ever. As you know, we've reached a record high um, uh, age of 78.8 of our average lifespan. In fact, if you um, are 65, you can expect another 20 years of really good living. Um, another way to think about it is two-thirds of the people who are 65 today represent two-thirds of all the people who have ever been 65 um, in, the, in the history of mankind are alive today. So talk about the power of, of aging and growth and vitality. And so I don't know about you, but if I'm going to live that long, I want to be engaged. I want to enjoy my life. So the whole idea of aging, it turns out that if you actually look at brain science, it is true. I have to admit, okay, your rate of processing information kind of slows, slows down as you age. It gets a little slower. That's because we have more and more information to deal with. So it really is best in your teens and your 20s. However, the science also shows that as your brain ages, um, we have better vocabulary. We have better problem-solving techniques. We have better rational thinking. We um, uh, better executive function. So it's really true that as you age, the science shows we are truly getting wiser. And it's not just your brain that's growing in wisdom, as, as uh, Charles Dickens said, and this is, you know, many, you know, um, a century ago, that it's not only the wisdom of the head, but also of the heart. So we have also learned that as you age, um, you actually really improve your social connection and friendships. Yes, you continue to add friends, you know, up until about the age of 50. But after 50, you start developing warmer, closer, and more in-depth relationships that are much more satisfying. In fact, there's another study that shows um, as you age, your relationships actually become less problematic, more satisfying because you know what to ignore. So as William James, who was a famous psychologist and philosopher said, the art of being wise is knowing what to overlook. So we are now proving uh, what authors, psychologists, you know, um, philosophers have said many, many years ago, it's really true, we do get older both in the heart and the mind as we age. So I think it is time to rethink what aging really means. Um, I don't know about you, but you know, I trained in medicine. I really thought I knew what aging was all about. I was an emergency doc. I saw plenty of older people, so I, you know, I understood it. And now, since I've been working at ARP, where it's really about us, the consumer, um, through our research, we've learned that aging is not at all like the common perception. It's time to blow that out of the water, right? What's our normal perception, right? You're born, you go up the career ladder, you get up to the top, you retire, and pfft, you fall off the edge, right? You go right out into the sunset, like John Wayne, if you're lucky, or you just fall off the deep end. Well, it turns out that as we age, we are actually constantly reinventing, regrowing, and changing ourselves. Your happiness index, it starts, you know, when you're younger, it starts kind of up here. It kind of goes down as the burden of life and caring for life and family and work and everything gets you. But after 50, your happiness index actually goes steadily up. So we're constantly reinventing. In fact, the founder of AARP, Ethel, Andrus, Ethel Percy Andrus, um, was actually 73 when she founded AARP. She had already retired as a high school principal. My mother retired um, in her 60s. She was a former banker. Um, and she was invited um, by China to go and teach about banking to China in her 60s. She had never spoken publicly in her life. She had never taught anybody anything other than her kids um, in her life. 
and totally changed careers with a new creative artistic expression of teaching and sharing with others. Um, and did that till she was 78 years old, working full time. And at 78, she finally came home and said, eh, I think I'll just work about 24 hours a week. I'm kind of done with the 50. So we have to rethink what aging means. We are constantly growing, changing. Opportunities are always there. It's always about reimagining what's next. So do I happen to say getting old is cool? I'm just going to say it again, that getting old is cool. And in fact, we think ourselves as very young. So when you're turning 65, you actually think you're 55. It turns out if you interview people who are 100, they think they're 83, actually 17 younger years younger than their average age. When you interview 100-year-olds, 77% of them say we giggle every day. And if you really want to think what happens, let's see, to change your perception of aging, let's see, about 12% know how to download on iTunes, 11% watch YouTube, 2% are on Facebook, but my all-time favorite, 1% does online dating. <laughs> okay, talk about creativity. <laughs> so, in fact, we think it's going up to 4%. You know, it's really, you know, the online dating is really proliferating here now, so... Um, and it turns out, again, we go back to the science, and in your midlife is actually when artists, scholars, are turn out to be the most prolific. There has been a number of studies, psychologists and, and others, who say, okay, you're, you know, as I said, this is not to say that in your 20s you aren't uh, very creative in problem solving um, because you have the imagination, you haven't had as many life experiences, but it turns out that your creativity for accumulating knowledge actually continues to grow well into your 60s and beyond. In fact, um, there was a professor, uh, Gallinson, from the University of California in Davis who actually studied geniuses, okay? I'm not one of those, but he actually studied geniuses and said there were really two kinds of geniuses. One were the creative geniuses that was all about imagination. That tended to happen in your 20s and, you know, in, in mathematics and physics. It tended to be a little younger because, you know, it was imagination. But when you looked at the geniuses who came, who build out of experience and experience of life, that actually happens much later stage of life. So if you think of Mark Twain, Paul Cezanne, Frank Lloyd Wright, Robert Frost, Virginia Woolf, all of them were the most prolific and did some of their best works as they got older. So... It's never too late to be creative. Um, and when we think of creativity, I know so you, you tend to say, okay, it's painting, it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, playing a musical instrument, writing a symphony. But when you think of creativity, it could be anything, anything that is challenged and causes you to expand your thinking, like photography, dancing, um, sculpture, crafts, you know, watching a Rembrandt, uh, learning how to tango. Um, and it turns out, that doing these kinds of cultural or artistic expressions, as you heard from our earlier introduction, really demonstrate that you can improve health. Um, George Washington University partnered with the elders who share the arts um, on cultural activities, and they were able to demonstrate that if you participated, your health was better, you had less doctor visits, this is really concrete, and you had fewer medications. Sweden had 10,000 people in a study, and they showed that people who went as simple as going to movies, going to concerts, um, museums, uh, any kind of artistic expression, actually live longer than those who didn't. In Norway, they noticed that if you participated in any of these kinds of cultural activities, there actually not only was your health better, but you had better life satisfaction, you had reduction of anxiety and depression. Um, we can drill down, let's talk about singing. Singing. I don't know how many of you heard of music therapy for dementia and Alzheimer's. It turns out that just 30 minutes of singing actually boosts your self-confidence. If you did, did, there was a study where they did a six-week course of singing for caregivers and dementia patients. They were 77 and years old and older, and it increased the ability to tell stories by 60 percent. There was a 39 um, percent. Uh, improvement in their short-term memory. These are people with profound dementia and their caregivers. There's even people looking at 70 to 99 years old who showed that people who, you know, that they compared both listening to music and singing, and it turns out that both of these would improve your cognition, your ability to, to um, improve your brain, improve your drawing, your life satisfaction, 
But if you sang more than listened, it increased it even more. So when you think about art and artistic creativity, it isn't the soft stuff. There's real science to show it makes a difference. So how did all this start? You know, where did this come from? So we were really, really lucky because in the 1950s was when MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging, actually started. And that was where we could actually begin to study the brain, watch the electrical impulses. And what we learned, astoundingly, as, as Gene Cohen, who wrote a watershed book, um, it, what it showed is that our brains actually can continue to grow. They don't just stop that we can actually improve vitality. It's not just theoretical, but it's actually possible. And it turns out that learning, whether it's through creative expression, by the doing, by the appreciation of arts, that kind of learning strengthens your existing connections in your brain, and it actually can build new ones. We did not know that your brain can actually continue to grow. It's called neuroplasticity, which means we can improve the connections that go on in your brain, or neurogenesis, I know you love these fancy words, but that just means you can grow new brain cells. I mean, if you do nothing, you lose 85,000 brain cells a day. I don't know about you, but I want to keep every one that I have, and it turns out the more you use your brain, you not only can keep what you have, but you can actually grow connections in your brain itself and reshape um, the brain. And if with vigorous kind of mental activity, and again, it doesn't have to be mathematical equations, but any kind of vigorous activity, you can sharpen your memory, you can improve your process time, you can do um, better attention span. So this kind of lifelong engagement, you know, really um, enjoying and, and delivering and experiencing life actually can improve your cognitive reserve, your ability for your brain to have extra, like you need physical reserve, you know, if you're, um, you exercise so you have a little extra reserve so you can do more. Well, the same thing goes for your brain, that if you have a lifestyle with both physical, mental, and social engagement, um, you can actually um, reduce some of the onset of disease, um, et cetera. So we know, for example, there are like 44 million people with Alzheimer's dementia, right? And it's something we all worry about, we think about. So there's some evidence to show that if you lead a stimulating life, you can delay or, re delay or reduce your onset or or potentially reduce your risk of Alzheimer's and dementia by 38%. And in fact, it's calculated that for every activity, you can reduce your risk by about 8%. And then what we mean by, you know, a stimulating life is, is your education, you know, constantly learning and training your brain, um, your occupation, constantly doing things that are new, and your lifestyle being extremely active. And that reserve can matter, you know, when, um, uh, Bob Woodward, the reporter, was, was shot and injured. The fact that he'd lived such an engaging, stimulating life meant he was able to bounce back faster than, than others. And in fact, um, when they actually looked um, of people, you know, and did autopsies, you know, after the fact, and they found evidence of dementia, you know, Alzheimer's, you know, physical evidence of that in the brain, it turns out that 20% of those individuals never exhibited any problems with dementia while they were alive. So it says, you know, yes, you know, we do worry about it. Yes, it does happen. But there are mitigating effects of activity, exercise, you know, artistic expression that can make a difference. So it's very true. Just like your body needs exercise, so does your brain. And we've learned that, you know, if you're listening to music, for example, it actually increases dopamine response, which is how your brain perceives rewards. If you sing, you can actually improve, increase your immunoglobulins, which helps you um, uh, decrease stress and increase um, your resilience to, to sickness. It increases your oxytocin, which is that wonderful hormone that makes you lovey-dovey and social interaction. Um, and uh, it can actually increase the brain in the Broca center, which is where your speech uh, comes from. There was actually a study in Spain where they took an entire community and said, you know, we're going to teach everyone bridge. That's social interaction, main game is intergenerational interaction. And over the next three years, healthcare costs utilization went down in that community. And you all know Gabby Gifford, you know, right? She got, you know, sadly, uh, you know, had been injured, shot in the brain. And a part of her recovery, because she had lost her ability to speech, to speak, and part of her recovery was one-on-one -on -one singing 
in training, which was how she regained her ability to speak. So these are just, you know, little tidbits and examples, you know, of a wide range of what you can do to improve um, how you live, how long you live, how well you live. And so, you, you know, what you should be doing every day is go, what am I doing for my brain today? You know, or not only is what I'm doing, but whatever you do for your brain is good for your body. What's good for your body is do good for your brain. So they're really, uh, you know, as we say in ARP, if you want to stay sharp, here are the five pillars that we think about. One is exercise, it's keeping fit. It turns out that three hours of walking a week can actually re reverse or halt brain atrophy. And if you don't want to do three hours a week, even to 30 to 60 minutes um, of walking per week still has some positive effect. Learning more. This is what I've been talking about all this brain, you know, as you talk about creative and expression. Um, it turns out that if you stimulate your brain, like cross-training, with a variety, okay, you can't just do the same thing over and over. I mean, everyone says, oh, if I do a lot of crossword puzzles, you know, that's going to make me really smart. Yes, it makes you really smart with crossword puzzles. But if you really want to grow your brain, you want to do a variety. What you want is challenge yourself outside of your comfort zone. You need variety. You need something that is new and novel. And what better than creative artistic expression to do so? Managing stress, right? If you walk into a quiet museum, sit in a library, read a book, those are all mechanisms of artistic expression, but also they reduce stress. And we know that if you have too much stress, it starts to limit your mental flexibility. In fact, human beings are the only mammals or animals that we know of that can create stress in our own mind with nothing happening, right? Like if a zebra gets stressed because a lion's chasing them, we get that, okay? But we're the only ones who sit there and go, Oh my God, I should have done this. Then you will start worrying, um, I didn't do this. Now I'm really worried that I didn't do this. Well, the more I worry about it, I didn't do it, it's making me worry even more that I haven't done this yet, you know, and, they know, and right, you get caught up in this whole, whole um, system and, and when that stress happens, it reduces your immune system and it hurts your cardiovascular system and has all these physical effects. So if you can learn the meditation, the yoga, the breathing, you know, sitting in a museum, reading a book, these are all elements of reducing stress that can actually help your brain, help your body. Eating right, um, yes we know, junk food creates junk food brain. So those omega-3s are really good um, vitamins. And uh, again, you can be creative even on the eating right. Reading recipes, trying new different kinds of recipes, creating the flowers that you're putting on the table, rejiggering you know, the table settings. All of those are novel, challenging variety. It's part of learning more. And then finally, you want to be social, you want to be engaged. As I said, one of the things we've learned about aging is your social engagement becomes more meaningful than ever. Um, and you can combine all of these. You know, uh, it just have a, start a book club, start reading books, you can read on your own, but you can take a walk with friends while you're reading the book, discussing you know, whatever you've learned. Um, these are, it's not like you have to do any of these independently, but it's a way to create life fulfillment. So we, we knew this at AARP, and what I like to say is um, 50 is not the new 30, and actually 50 is the new 50. This is a time where we can reimagine, take stock of our lives, what else we can do. As, as Joanne Jenkins, our, our CEO for AARP says, you know, to disrupt aging, we have to own our own age. And I, as I look at it, we got to be proud of who we, who we are and proud of as we age. Our happiness index goes up. I'm sorry, that takes it over anybody. You know, we definitely do own it. And it's not necessarily uh, just about the soft, the, you know, the artsy sort of thing. It turns out that when they're actually looking at new business entrepreneurs, remember creativity, starting new business, new startups, it turns out that the fastest growing rate of new entrepreneurs are 55 and older. And whereas the 50 and older used to be um, less than half, they are now approaching half, and we now think are over half of the you know, uh, entrepreneurs, new startups, are actually over 50. Um, teachers, you know, who reach their retirement in, into their mid-60s are starting new businesses designing scarves. There was a retired police officer, you know, who retired and started his own website where he uh, allowed um, other law enforcement individuals to actually advertise, you know, services, lines, you know, house cleaning or whatever services. So just because you're getting older doesn't mean there aren't way new opportunities. 
In fact, do you want to own your life story that each of each and every one of us have a, have a story and a story to tell? And it turns out that storytelling, reminiscent therapy, all actually improve your sense of well-being and can improve your health. We just did a study with the University of Iowa using the art of storytelling, and we saw increased satisfaction with life, um, better resilience um, through the art of storytelling. It's the matter of leaving legacy. Um, and he also won the Blue Cross Blue Shield Massachusetts Foundation that is looking for improving the health of vulnerable populations. And we've just issued a grant for the art of storytelling and whether or not it can actually improve your diabetes and your diabetes management. In fact, there are researchers out there who said, say that autobiography for the older adult is like chocolate for the brain. And you know what? It doesn't have to be that difficult or that simple. I mean, I even have my own story, okay? Um, so about three years, well actually a little over three years ago, I was, you know, crossing the street in, in D.C. in a crosswalk with a green light that said walk, and I got partway into the crosswalk and boom, got hit by a car. Okay, a little change, a little life-changing event. Um, and you know, I always thought of myself as pretty nerdy. You know, I was, I was one of those really science kids in high school, you know, the ones who always sat on the sidelines. I didn't have a bit of art, artistic, in me at all. So you would think for somebody like me to talk about artistic, creative expression would be really, really difficult. So it turns out in my recovery, I relearned how to walk. I had my walker, and then I had my cane, and I would go out with my cane, and everyone would go, oh my goodness, Johnny, will you not bump into that little old lady? You know, you're going to knock her over. Oh, my poor thing, you got hit by a car. Oh my God. I'd go home and think, Wow, I didn't know I was so sick. I, I thought I was walking. I thought it was a good thing, you know. <laughs> so as I got better, you know, you know, I was told, well, try walking without your cane. So I would walk without my cane at home, you know, and I'd put my cane down. And then 20 minutes later, I'm going, I don't know where I put my cane. Where did I put it? I couldn't find it. So I started tying a red ribbon on my cane. So I thought, well, if I put a ribbon on, I'll put a little flower on. I'll put a little flower, maybe another ribbon. Maybe I'll throw a little more. And, and it was great because when I was in my house, I put my cane down. I go, oh, that's where I left my cane. I could see it from across the room. Well, then I would forget, and I went outside with my cane, forgetting that I had done all this because I got so used to it. And the response from people around me was so totally different. Oh, my God, that is so cool. Did I tell you about my mom, my wife? Do you know I had to use a cane? I wish I had thought of that. And total strangers are coming up and telling me the story of their lives. I'm in an elevator, you know, people are taking, you know, talking like, how did you do this? I said, yeah, you know, and instead of, oh, you poor thing, it was like, oh my God, how exciting, how wonderful. In fact, I was on an airplane and the stewardess was so excited to see this cane. She said, can I take a picture of that? I want to show my mom how we did, how you did this. I said, absolutely. By the time I got off the plane, the stewardess came up to me and whispered, everyone wants to know who you are, that we were taking a picture of you. I said, no, it's my cane. <laughs> So, so I just want to say, you don't have to be an artist. You know, you can be a nerd like me, but you can tap into that creativity. And what it brings you, which it brought me, was hope, resilience, connection with others. And it turned out that I'm much happier, the essence of health and living. And, you know, I don't recommend getting hit by a car as your mechanism to do it, but it can be done. We have a wonderful board member, Barbara O'Connor, uh, who is also really nerdy. She's a techie. You know, I know she would describe herself as that. And as she got older, she started, you know, having friends who were getting ill, you know, cancer and other things. And so here's this techie. She got some beads and started making necklaces. And she saw her friends actually lighting up. So she actually started a monthly group that every month she has all these buckets, you know, in a little uh, senior center, has all these little buckets of beads. And anyone can come. And if you know someone who's sick or ill or you want to do something for someone else, you can come make a necklace, jewelry, et cetera. You don't have to know anything. There's some designs you can follow. And she has found that it's not only been great for the, give, for the recipients, but also for the givers. And one of the things that we have learned has been so powerful in resetting your brain, reducing stress, changing life around, is that expression of gratitude and what you're thankful for. And you can do, exhibit that gratitude and thankful by making something uh, for someone else or, you know, something that makes you smile. So um, I can't guarantee that you will never, ever have dementia. I can't guarantee um, that you will have 
um, the most awesome and perfect life. But I can imagine that we can make the most of what we do have by taking our brains to the gym, taking our bodies to the gym, learning yoga, learning language. If you like to travel, just learning new culture. Learn to, you know, yo-yo if, if that's what it takes. Because we know all of these things increase your problem solving, your happiness, your resilience. Um, you know, so my hope and my takeaway and my hope for all of you is that today's the day you can start. Make a really good faith effort to pursue something creative. Pick up a book, you know, draw a stick figure, whatever it is, to, to really make that connection between the wisdom of your brain and the wisdom of your heart and use that art to connect with others. We are social beings after all, and we know that with social connectivity, with social connectivity, you can actually enhance your resilience, your sense of well-being, problem solving, and live that better life. And as one very famous neuroscience researcher said, Dr. Nesbun, we do want to protect that wonderful miracle that is between your ears. You can do it. So thank you very much.